night. My name is Betty White. I'm here to talk about my marriage with uh, a compulsive gambler. We got married in 1984. Uh, he was 30, I was 27. We met in Florida. I had moved from Tennessee and started a job. We lived in Florida for approximately 13 to 14 years. At that point, we moved to Tennessee. We have no children, never had children. Uh, the only thing we ever had was puppies, and we took care of a lot, a lot of puppies. Um, from there, when we moved to Tennessee, the purpose of it all was to take care of my mom and dad. They both were very ill, and uh, it was something that Terry really didn't want to do, and maybe I didn't quite understand it at the point, but uh, we moved there, lived there for quite some time, had a wonderful life of great friends, everything that was going for us. But what I found out um, in Tennessee that it's surrounded by casinos in every state just about except for Tennessee. If I, he had a problem at that point, I didn't really know about it. We used to go to Vegas together. It wasn't something that um, was noticeable. Of course, I realize now through all the time that I've had to think about it, um, he probably his issues started maybe when we moved to Tennessee because he was somewhere he didn't like. Uh, but he gambled all his life. As a child, after dinner on a Friday night, they would play poker. It was, that was the routine, and they played for money. It was just the common denominator for the family. Um, it was not something I enjoyed. It, but so he started as a child, probably five, six years old. So it wasn't like it started in Tennessee or did it start in Florida or... It was his whole life. There was a person in Brentwood who won uh, the World Series of Poker. And his mind triggered at that point, I can see it to this day in his face, that he thought, if I can win the World Series of Poker, that would change our life forever. And I said, well, that's almost impossible. That's like going and winning the lottery. So the online gambling, that's when I noticed that he didn't do it for fun anymore. It was becoming a job, basically. It was, we had work, but at, at times I would see him and I'd say, are you working on the computer or are you working on a job? And he'd say, no, I'm, I'm just playing online and it takes no money, I can win my way up. And of course, here I'm naive to online gambling. I didn't even hear of such a thing and had no reason to even think about it. He was always either playing blackjack, craps, um, and the casinos treated us like a king and a queen. So, you know, I didn't relate to any of this being a problem. Just to let you know what it was like in Tennessee, he was the basketball coach and soccer coach for girls from the age of four all the way up to 10 years old. And uh, there was a waiting list for him for the kids to get on his team. He was a well-known coach. They loved him, adored him, because the one thing about Terry was he had the personality you could not believe. When they would run out on the field, he's announcing them. Well, no one in Tennessee would ever announce somebody running out on a soccer field. But that was the joy and the hope he gave to a lot of different children. And then those kids ended up being state champions not too long ago. I just got a, com a telephone call for someone that had not seen me yet, because people don't deal with it very well. And she called basically screaming because she knew Terry and I had been in our home probably 50 times and said there would be no way possible that that man would ever do such a thing to you because of his behavior in Tennessee. He did have an unbelievable life. We had a perfect little world. But do I think he was gambling at the time? Yes. Do I think it was somewhat under control? I'm not sure. But it wasn't quite as easy for him because... He was so busy. It was either work, basketball, soccer, and we were always involved with all the people constantly. I spent so much time taking care of my mother and father due to the, their illnesses. My dad had several going on, so did my mom. There were times I'd be at the hospital later in the phase of our time in Tennessee from 8 o'clock in the morning to 8 o'clock at night. So that gave him opportunities, which I wasn't there. But what he told me over and over, which because he was a loving man, that you go take care of your mom. You do what it takes. You take care of 
your dad. I'll take care of the rest of the things that are going on. It'll be okay. And I really, truly, for a long time, felt that it was okay. If people were in Tennessee here today, they'd say they were the perfect marriage. They were the couple that everyone wanted, everyone wanted to be. And still to this day, people cannot face me because it's difficult for them because they knew us as a team to see what gradually happened. When you're on a computer and you have nobody to look at when you lose a big hand, it's, it, you become numb and you just consider it just part of, it's okay, it's no big deal. But I realize now that there is that fine line and when did he know to stop? On my 27th wedding anniversary, I was in Disney World with my niece and nephew from his family. And we got a phone call from his relatives stating that he was in jail. And here it's my 27th wedding anniversary. And I get a call that he's in jail. They don't know what for sure what's going on. So I immediately run back to West Palm Beach. My niece, who was with me, is a counselor. And she says, I, I believe that Uncle Terry probably has a problem. Something's really wrong here. And that's the point when I recognize I need help. And that's when I call the Florida Council. For what he was arrested, I now know why. But at the time, I didn't. And he, he made a story that was, uh, you know, I'm, again, I still believed. But he was the most convincing. He was so talented, and now I do realize it, of being a person that could lie and have no expression, he had a poker face. At that point, I knew if he's been arrested, I've just moved to Florida, something serious has to be going on. We called the Florida Council, I talked to Cedric, I can remember his voice, the time, and he was so kind to me, and he says, we're gonna work this out. I left Terry in jail all day. I didn't, I didn't go get him. And, and then he got his own way home. I, he, However he bailed himself, I don't know. At that point, I said, we're going to counseling. We're going to find out what's going on with you. And if it's gambling, we're going to have to resolve it. There wasn't one bit of truth in anything in that counseling. It's just, and I wanted to believe him so much. This is a man that I still love very much. You're talking about 27 years of marriage. And I had asked my counselor, do you think he's telling the truth? I started to feel very uneasy. Something was really not right. But you know, how do you figure that out? I was at a disadvantage. I was all alone down here in Florida. I was away from my family and really didn't understand the complexity of all of it. On his birthday, April 26, we were sitting out uh, uh, by the ocean and we saw a school of dolphin. And at that point, he's telling me that we're gonna have such a wonderful life in Florida that our, all our dreams will come true because I loved Florida. This is the place I always wanted to live. And, and uh, he did too. So you're talking about a timeline now, April 26th. Then uh, May 12th, we went back to Disney World. The whole family went back up there. We were together for the weekend. He was singing to me all over the parks. Life was just beautiful. So you can imagine, I'm thinking, and he's told me he's resolved his problem, that it was simply a bad check and it was an error by the bank and you don't worry about it. I've taken care of it. It's, it's okay. And of course, I hadn't, and I was going through my counselor and I said, are we working through? Do you think we're getting through the process? Is everything going? He, it was, he never told the truth in one counseling. And I didn't really know it to after the fact. It's a, it's a great thing that I had the Florida Council because I really believe everything happens for a reason because if I had not had the Florida Council, what would have happened to me afterwards? That's a question I always say to everyone. So it was meant for me to meet the Florida Council and my counselor and all the people that are associated with the group because they're the ones that supported me after the fact. So I have family and I have friends that come in from Tennessee the weekend before it happened. Everything's great. They see no difference in him. He's jovial, happy. That Tuesday morning after, he told me, I have failed. I have destroyed everything. We have nothing. And of course, I called my counselor and I said, you won't believe what he has done. And 
I was in the state of shock, as you can imagine. I called um, the niece and said, can you come up? I need your help. This is pretty bad, and I'm not sure what I'm going to do. She was there, and that particular night she stayed with me, he tore the house apart. He was out of control. And I said, I know I've got to leave, but of course, financially, I had no way to, to get out. I had no money. It was all gone. I mean, I was basically trapped. There was two days of, we'll fight back from this. We can always fight back. There's a way we can fight back. It's going to be okay. I realized he was just trying to basically keep me quiet. Thursday, uh, we had dinner, and um, I went to bed, and we didn't say a whole lot. There wasn't much to say. What do you say? I'm trying to run through my mind. How am I going to survive this? What am I going to do? It wasn't about me and him anymore. It was, and it wasn't really any threat. I had definitely said, if this is the case, then I'm going to have to think about what's going on. Did I threaten him in any way? Absolutely not. Did I say I want a divorce? No. Here I am Thursday, and he cooks a fantastic, he was a fantastic chef. He was unbelievable. Uh, not a lot of communication. Wasn't a lot of words said. I went to sleep. Three in the clock in the morning, he woke me up. And he says, I want you to know something, Betty. I love you with all my heart, and I will always love you. And I said, I know. I understand. And I went back to sleep. At 8.02, Friday morning, I'm still in bed. He takes a between a 12, 13-pound Iron Angel statue and slams me in the head on the first time on the back of my head. I then instantly wake up, and at that point, he takes a knife from my chest bone down to my belly button and rips me wide open. Again, at that point, I start to fight, and I'm looking at him because it doesn't even look like Terry. His face is totally blank. It's as if it's not even the man, and I, I why are you doing this to me? How could you do such a horrible thing? And the, the knife got stuck, so he was yanking me up and down, trying to get, because it went all the way through to my back. And then at, at that point, he started with another knife. He stabbed me repeatedly nine times in the chest, which at that, again, I'm fighting. I'm, again, he has me pinned. I'm fighting as hard as I can. I bit him. I got his DNA under my nails, because I knew if anybody in Tennessee would never believe that this man would have done such, such a thing to me. It's funny what runs through your mind when you're going through something so horrific. You know, I never watched CSI my whole life, so, but in my mind I knew if I didn't have some proof that he did this to me, nobody would ever believe that he did such a horrific thing. Now, after the nine times he stabbed me there, he took another knife. At that point, he stabbed me again several times in my uh, stomach. And, um, and then he started to, when I was trying to fight back and forth, he, he was striking me whatever way he possibly could. The total of stab wounds were close to 15. It depends on it, how you want to count them, but it's 15. He then slammed me in the head the second time with the angel statue, which knocked me out for a little while. But at that point, I think he felt that he, it was over. Um, I was there by myself. He kept coming back. He came back three times to check on me, and I had to play dead. And how did I do that? It's funny. It's a story that goes back when I was a child, and it was the Cuban Missile Crisis, and kids, you had to duck and hide. And, and, and I, what runs through your mind in situations like this is whatever, and I kept saying to myself as a kid, if they come over, if they're going to strike, I'll play dead. So I put my face in the pillow and so that he couldn't see that I was still having somewhat of able to breathe, which was torture. I could hear him taking a shower. I could hear him cleaning the house. He actually took the two knives that didn't. He took them and put them in the dishwasher. Now, this was a fairly large home. Uh, my little dog, Katie, was on top of me, 
and he took her away from me. Uh, she put the pressure on the wound and he cleaned her up and put her in her crate. Uh, there was three phone calls he made that day. He called his mother and, he, and uh, my counselor from Florida Council called and said, how's Betty doing? You know, what can we do? And he said, well, she's sleeping, she's okay. And um, he also talked to another individual that particular day, very calm, they had no, didn't hear any, any kind of problem in his voice. So that's something I learned after the fact that, but it's amazing to me that he could have been so calm and understood what was going on. So there, from there about, I'd say five o'clock, I didn't hear him anymore. And I knew the only way that I was going to survive is to cross the house. And it took all the power I had because you got to remember of all the different wounds and the head injury. And, but I crossed the house looking for a phone and he had taken all the phones. So there was no way I could reach anybody. So at that point, I'm thinking this is it. I'm not going to make it. There's no way I can reach the outside world. This is where I'm going to die. Um, but what happened, 12 hours later, he called the police. He was heading to uh, Orlando. He had my cell phone. He called West Palm Beach and told him that he had critically injured his wife and she's at such and such address. This was 12 hours later now. He called and he also gave my brother's phone number and so that the detectives could reach my family. I think he pretty much felt that it was over for me. Uh, lo and behold, here comes the miracles because who arrived? The detectives who immediately started talking to me, the uh, paramedics who were wonderful. You know, I was so thrilled to see another human being. You just cannot imagine what it felt like to, because uh, I, I felt like that would be never a possibility. When they walked in, at that point, it was the first time that they brought me back five times. Um, and I, again, it, through my therapy and whatever, that was a pretty horrific situation in itself after what I've been through, but I was still so grateful because I'm seeing human beings. Then all of a sudden I say, what is the noise that's going on? I hear a lot of racket. And they said, well, it's a life flight. It's landed in the front, front yard. And um, I said, well, I can't pay for that. I have no way to pay for it. And they said, oh, sweetheart, you don't realize if you don't take this, you're not going to live. So I ended up at St. Mary's Hospital, which was another wonderful place to be because they took care of me. Uh, as I was arriving, uh, the detectives were asking me questions. He, he could not believe how I kept up with everything and told him what happened, where he, you know. At that point, uh, he had told me that he had discarded the phone in the orange groves on his way to Orlando. And, um, and I said, well, if he thinks I'm still alive, he's, I'm pretty afraid because I think he would finish it. So um, I'm talking through all of this. I had people to pray with me because I felt like at this point that I'm dying, but I don't want to be angry with him and I want to forgive him because if, I don't want to die angry and I don't want to have a heavy heart. So at that point, I forgave him because in my world, that's what it's all about. And, and what ran through my mind is um, 27 years of marriage, and this wasn't Terry, wasn't the man I knew for so very long. So I was in surgery approximately 12 to 15 hours. They put me back together. I woke up and I went, wow, I'm, I can't believe I'm here. I asked the... Uh, doctors, do you think there's a possibility I won't make it? And they said, it very well may be. And I said, okay, I understand. Because I wanted the truth. I mean, this is something that after what you've been through, and I think I've told them several times, just tell me what's happening. Just make me aware. I'd rather know the truth than to not know the truth. At that point, um, I asked for a priest and, and they got the group because I was at St. Mary's Hospital. They surrounded the uh, Gurney and we all prayed and I asked for uh, forgiveness for his soul 
because I did not, in my mind, did not at that time, want to die with a heavy heart or any hatred because who wants to leave this earth with any hatred in your heart? St. Mary's Hospital, they were phenomenal. They never left my side, but they knew I had such fear. I was so scared that he was going to come back and, and complete the task in his mind. And so they had police inside and outside the door so that I would be rest assured that it's going to be okay. Uh, again, they had me under a different name, which was a little confusing in me in the beginning. And everybody in the hospital thought I was Lucy. There was only one person that really knew my identity, which was at the time a very important thing. The detectives kept it out of the newspapers, out of the TV. They were amazing because if he had heard that I had been life flighted or I don't know how he would have reacted because he was still around at that point. And so the recovery time, um, my family, again, I was under, they only could get information about how I was doing. They really couldn't talk to me. They wanted me isolated, which was another thing. Can you imagine going through what I have and have no familiar faces and not, not being able to communicate with anybody? And, uh, but it was important and they explained it to me, but they never, I had either the priest was by my side, either a nun was by my side, they never left me alone, which was pretty important uh, for just my security. So the detective come in and I was standing up, which they thought was unbelievable that I could stand up. And he asked me, are you gonna be one of those wives that once you, you, you'll forgive him and take him back? And I said, oh no. I want you to find him, and we got to take care of this. I will not forgive him on this matter. This isn't right. So at that point, they really started pursuing everything. And um, again, he took all the phones. He got rid of his cell phone. At the time, I didn't realize you can track by a cell phone, which he was pretty much aware of that. He ended up in Orlando, very close to Disney World. Um, at that point, I was there from... I guess it was Tuesday afternoon, uh, the priest come in and said, Betty, I have some news for you. I want to talk to you. And again, they're handling me with kid gloves because I've gone through a lot in the last, and they said, we want to tell you that uh, your husband is gone. He's committed suicide. They found him near Disney World and um, he took pills. So he said, it looked like the whole world had been lifted off my shoulders because the fear was gone. And then all of a sudden they're starting to call me Betty. So it was as if it was a bright day for me. At that point, I said, let's call his family, make them aware where I am, um, which because I still loved them very much. They were a part of my life for 31 years. Of course, you know, they were in the state of shock. Well, at first they saw me with no hair and of course the body con my condition of my body my brother bald like a baby and uh, you know this is pretty horrific for a family that's been so close and but we went to a cousin of her my sister-in-law's house uh, because they needed to get my things together find my dogs and um, the detective the one thing he did he saved my dogs he took it then he personally took them to the pound and said you don't kill these dogs until I talked to you, and I couldn't believe that my dogs were saved. I stayed at uh, my sister-in-law's cousin's house, and the first night, my family grieved for Terry. My brother says, I've lost my brother. This is just, so it's a process of how do you handle it? You've got people grieving for him, grieving for you. Yeah, but the Florida Council the counselor stayed in touch with me the whole way because he knew this was going to be some really difficult times. Um, I then, my family, we ended up in Nashville. I stayed for the first six months, I stayed with family, but the surprises just started. They ran a credit report for me because, again, for the first two weeks I was back in Nashville, I could move. There was nothing. I just was happy, I couldn't eat. It was just unbelievable amounts of pain and possibilities, it was just horrible. But at that point, uh, my family said, we need to find out what's going on, Betty. 
something's not right. So they ran a credit report, and that's where I found out he had forged my name. And uh, with my banking accounts that I had that were personally my name, he had forged checks on that uh, in casinos to anywhere possible. He had run through all of the money and um, found out he had put um, loans in my name and found out that the house in Brentwood, which he had told me from day one was about to sell, uh, which was somewhat the truth, uh, was in foreclosure. And this is a home that I own from 1996. At that point, I found out that there were liens of the IRS. And um, so can you imagine going through what I've been through? And we're talking about a period of four weeks that I've lost my husband. I've lost everything I've, I've known as my life. And then I run a credit report and then really see what he had done as far as the forgeries, uh, the bad checks. It, everything you could possibly imagine was there. So the battle had, the second battle had just begun. How was I going to go over and try to handle each situation? So the first thing I had to do was go and find out about my house, and um, which was in my name. Luckily, I worked with a real estate agent, and it took a period of five months. But he, he was right. We did have a buyer for the house, but he just didn't tell me that he forgot to make the mortgage payments. So that part of it was true, so you understand some things were true, some things were not true. I sold the house. I didn't make a dime off of it. All I cared about was just getting out from underneath it. It wasn't, you have to understand the strategy was take each situation and try to resolve it and move on. But I also found out he had forged my name at the Home Association. It was just one thing, and that I owed money to the Home Association, and he had signed, his name, using my last name, not his name. It just, each time I, every time I looked at something, it was something new. Uh, did I still forgive him? Absolutely. Because I couldn't handle, I couldn't be mad and angry at this point because would it serve any purpose? No. So then I had talked to the Florida Council and um, Mr. Ash and talked about the IRS and what could I possibly do? Is there any, and he suggested the innocent spouse, and um, which took a period of, which I started working on, and uh, a friend of mine, a wonderful sweetheart of a young lady, hired an attorney for me in California. So it first started off with innocent spouse, and then there was a remaining amount, which because of the situation I was going through in my financial state, it all has been resolved now. As far as credit cards where he, there was bunches of credit cards that he signed my name and um, I'm still working on that because it's difficult when he was my husband and they say, well, he was your husband, can you prove? And it, it's difficult, but I'm working on each task. Uh, as far as the banking, uh, there was no way I could get that, the funds back from there because the time had lapsed. And um, so I, I resolved myself to that too. Uh, again, my strategy was take one task at a time, get it resolved. You're going to have a life again, Betty. You're going to have a life again. And that's what I have accomplished. 30 days after I got home, and again, we're all trying to figure out, we're starting just to understand what had actually happened. and. You know, my family, I found out that he had borrowed money from people that lived in Tennessee. You know, I started hearing stories about how complex it was, you know, he had borrowed money from a couple of very, very good friends of ours. So that was another situation, which they knew I could never repay them, but um, that was something that was just devastating to me, that he used a friendship to gain money. Again, I'm working with all this situation. I have no funds. I have no way to eat, I have no way. My family stepped up, friends started stepping up. Um, but approximately five weeks, six weeks after I got back to Tennessee, someone called and said, Terry's on TV. And I said, what? And so I never looked at it, I didn't want to see it. But 
he was indicted from the state of Tennessee and he was indicted from the state of Florida. And now we all know why this all come about. They um, called, didn't speak to me because I wasn't prepared to talk to people about these things and talked to family members and of course they told the story of what happened to me and of course they said, well the story's over, he's dead, but he knew it was coming. And if I look back now of all the scenario of the April and how he did the Disney World trip and all of those things, I pretty much know he, pretty, he had to know what was coming. I didn't, none of the rest of the family members. So that was the, at that point I said, aha. You know, okay, still there wasn't so much so bad that we couldn't still recover from it, but this was the final straw. He was, he was basically going to probably go to prison for the rest of his life. I don't really know and never asked about it and don't really care because at this point it was about Betty and survival. And uh, so that's the end. That's what happened. And um, so he was going to be indicted. And I don't know. I know it was lots and lots and lots of money. Don't know how much. Never really cared. Um, but this is the reason why he committed suicide. So I've always asked the question, why did he have to go to the extreme that he did with me? And I've had many answers, but the one I've come up with after three years is that Terry really didn't want me to face all of this heartache, because it has been heartache. In his mind, he had no way of thinking that I'd ever survive this, and um, it just got too much for him. His mind just shut down in, in so many ways is what I think. Um, if I could push a button today and have him back where we were years ago, I would do it. You never stop loving someone. Our love was so deep. Um, what gambling can do to someone is devastating. What it did to him and to me, I sure would not want this to happen to someone else. It's a disease, which I now understand because of all the counseling I've had and through going to conferences that some people just really have a very difficult time overcoming it. And uh, it was just too far gone for him. It was years probably, I don't really know. What I want to say to everyone today is how important the Florida Council for Compulsive Gambling was to me because if they were not there for me, and they helped me with the financial problems, but also the guidance. And even after I left Florida, they worked with me every week. It was so important that I talked to someone that understood, because in Tennessee, no one could at all relate to this issue. Where talking to my counselor, he knew the two of us before. He, he knew that I didn't have any idea what was going, how reassuring it was for me to have someone on my side to help me, it, it gave me the strength and the ability to move on, to have that person behind me and knew the whole story. It, you don't, you know, your mind can play games on you when you're thinking, well, how did I, how could I not see this? What a, but the truth is, is if it hadn't been for my counselor to say, no, Betty, this was something, he had a disease. He, he kept reinforcing that for me. That probably helped save my life. Because there were days when I thought, wow, this is getting, this is just a little too much for one human being. Through the council, what I realized, this is a disease. And if you think it can affect you, you need to think twice. It could affect a lot of different people in so many ways. I, I didn't realize the lottery is an issue to whatever. It affects everyone in some way. It could be a family member to a friend. We just are not that aware of the problem. So. If I want to say something to anybody is, think about it. It's there. It's, it's a silent, it's not out in the open. You'd have to know what you were looking for to discover it, which I was not aware. Without the Florida Council, I don't know where I'd be today. They helped save my life. And it's just so important that people reach out 
that we touch more people, the counselors that are out there realize that let's just not let this happen to one more person. And they call me the miracle lady, and truly I am a miracle because I survived. And I'm here sitting, talking about it today, and the purpose of me talking about this is just to not let one other person go through what I've been through. But I tell everyone, it may be that I lost everything, but I still have Betty White, and I'm still here. Thank you.